up next on Walking by Faith. God himself will wipe away every tear from their eye. No more death, sorrow, or crying. There'll be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. The hurts from your past, your failures, your disappointments, the crippling pains that you've had as you've experienced different things in life, every one of them, God is going to wipe them away. And heaven is going to be a place of perfect peace and joy beyond your imagination. Hello, I want to welcome you to Walking by Faith today. Thank you so much for being with us. And we are finishing an exciting series of messages. Now, we've been unpacking the Apostles' Creed, the oldest creed in Christendom. And today we're going to be looking at the last two phrases of that creed, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. We're going to be looking at what does eternity look like for a Christian? What are the benefits? What are some of the great things that we have to look forward to? And we're going to be talking about the body, about how important what you do with your body is. So often in our culture, we really miss this in Western culture, that yet when you look at your Bible, when you look at historic Christianity, your body is extremely important to God and what you do with your body is important. So I'd like you to come with me right now as we join this message right as it begins. Let's confess together the creed and let's go back to we believe, all right? We believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Now, we're going to look at these last two phrases today, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Listen to 1 Thessalonians 4. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, how many believe it? Even so, God will bring with him those who sleep or those who have died in Jesus. The way God raised Jesus from the dead, he will also raise you from the dead. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain of the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. And we who are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Christians have always understood that your body is important and that what you do with your body is important. You were redeemed spirit, soul, and body. Now, at the time the New Testament was written, we had the, the Greek old Roman culture, and in their minds, the body was not important. Right? Their thought was the spirit's important. But your body is unimportant and it's temporary. Right? Someday it dies, it gets put in the grave, and it's there forever. And your spirit's important, but your body is not. And so whether you get drunk, you commit adultery, fornication, uh, it's only your body. It's really not important because it's not your spirit. And their thought was someday your body dies, put in a grave, it never emerges, and your spirit would go to the land of the dead. Now, that was not what Christians believed. Christians believed your body is important. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're to glorify God with your body. In fact, your body doesn't even belong to you. It was redeemed and it belongs to God. Let me give you a couple of verses here. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 6 and verse 17. It says, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but you commit sexual immorality, sins against his own body. Or don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who's in you, who you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. It's my body. I'll do what I want to. Not if you're a Christian. You were bought with a price. You belong to God. Spirit, soul, and body. Therefore, glorify God with your body and your spirit, which are God's. What do you think about this? This is very, very different from our thinking today, but this is Christian thinking. 
right? Let's go to the first, second, third century, right? We have Christians. They're, they're in Rome. A Christian would die. How many have heard of the catacombs, right? The Christians would go down in the catacombs and they would bury their dead. Now, if you go to Rome today and you can take a tour and they will tell you, we can show you over 5 million Christian graves down in these catacombs, right? The Christians would go down there, they would bury their dead, and they would worship. Now, they would do that contrary to the culture. The, at, at that time, 98% of people in the Roman Empire were cremated. But if they were caught burying their dead, they were going to end up in the gladiatorial games. And they weren't going to be gladiators, they were going to be eaten by lions. So it could possibly cost them their life all right? But they said, we are going to bury our dead because what we do with the body, it is important. All right? The Bible teaches us to sow the body looking to the resurrection. All right? Now, let me give you a couple of things to just think about. Abraham is the father of the faith. And we're told to imitate the faith of Abraham. The Bible very clearly talks distinctly about Abraham's wife, Sarah, dying and Abraham buried his wife. By the way, it tells us where Abraham is buried, his wife is buried, Isaac, his wife, Jacob, his wife, they're all buried. Moses died and God performed the service. And the Bible says that God buried Moses. All right? The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. All right? In the New Testament, we have Stephen, the first martyr. The Bible says godly men take Stephen and bury him. Now, I think it's interesting in the United States, all cemeteries are, are, are the same, right? When we bury a person, we bury them with their head to the uh, west, to their feet to the east, because the Bible says when Jesus returns, he will appear in the eastern sky. So you pop up and you go, ha, ah, Jesus, here I am, ready to go. And that is literally why we do that, all right? Now, the, the, the year is 1300. Rome is as pagan as it ever was, all right? 98% of people are cremated. 2% are buried. 313 comes around. Constantine has a vision, becomes a Christian. Shortly thereafter, Christianity becomes the official religion of the Roman Empire. And by the year 400, get this, 98% of people in the Roman Empire are buried and only 2% are cremated because of the Christian influence. The Christians believe even in death, what I do with my body is important. Somebody says, well, what if somebody's cremated? No problem. Eaten by a shark, burned in a, bear, in a building? No problem. When resurrection day comes. But as an act of faith, they wanted to bury their dead because what they did with their body, they knew was important. All right? So we're going to jump right ahead quickly to everlasting life because I've got a lot to say about this. Everlasting life. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, what we tend to think of is we're going to have life forever. And we say to people, you know, become a Christian and you'll live forever. And that's true. But yet it's misleading because if you don't become a Christian, you're going to live forever. It's just a matter of where you're going to live. Some are going to live forever in heaven. Some are going to live forever in hell. But everybody is going to live forever. So let me talk to you just a minute about this word here, everlasting life. In the, the original Greek language, the Koine Greek, it's the word Z-O-E, Zoe. Um, nowadays, a lot of people are naming their little girls Zoe. I think a cute little name. Now, it means something different than what we think it means. All right? In fact, uh, I have right here my, my translator's New Testament. Now, suppose you were to go and work with Wycliffe Bible Translators and they sent you to South America. You went way back in the jungle and you lived with an indigenous people. You learned their language. You put together an alphabet and you began to translate their language, uh, or excuse me, the, yeah, their language into the New Testament or the New Testament into their language. One of the tools that you're given is a translator's New Testament. And it has all sorts of great notes to help you as you're translating the New Testament. Now, this is what it says about that word everlasting life and eternal life. It says, it says, in the New Testament, it is given to all true believers, this kind of life. The word eternal draws attention to the quality of the life 
not to its duration in a temporal sense. In other words, when it says eternal, it's not talking about how long it lasts. It's talking about where it comes from. It comes from the eternal realm. It comes from the eternal one. In other words, God gives you his life. God puts something inside you. 1 John 3, 9 says that his seed or his life remains in you. He puts his life inside you. Now, how long does it last? Forever. It lasts forever, right? But it drawing attention to the quality of the life, not to its duration in a temporal sense. Thus, eternal life can be experienced by believers even while subject to temporal conditions of earthly life. Translators should be careful to avoid expressions which mean no more than a timeless continuation of life after death, right? So in other words, this eternal life that you receive, it doesn't begin to work when you die. It begins to work immediately. The moment you receive Jesus, something happens on the inside. God puts this Zoe life inside you. How long does it last? Forever. It lasts forever. Right? Your salvation doesn't begin when you die. Your salvation begins immediately when you receive Jesus. He makes you a new person on the inside. You become a part of his family instantly. Right? Now, Jesus said this, Matthew 25, verse 46, and these will go to everlasting punishment, but the righteous to everlasting or eternal life. Greek word is the same, right? Everlasting punishment, everlasting life. Same word. So we cannot have eternal life in heaven forever without having an eternal separation from God in a place called hell. Now, when Jesus returns in Revelation chapter 20, five times in six verses, it mentions the fact that Jesus will rule and reign for a thousand years on this earth. And after that, we have what theologians refer to as the eternal kingdom. Now, if you, if you have a Bible or you're taking notes, um, write down Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 5. And if you're not taking notes, write down Revelation 21, 1 through 5. All right? <laughs> You, you, you want this. Now, whether you're a Lutheran, a Wesleyan, an Arminianist, a Calvinist, or a Catholic, all believe the same thing about this, all right? We all believe this, but here's what's interesting. 98% of people sitting in churches do not understand that we believe this, all right? We have this picture of heaven that we're going to go somewhere and we're going to wear a sheet, we're going to float on a cloud, we're going to wear a harp and eat grapes. And there's going to be a little naked baby angel floating around with bows and arrows, you know. That's, that, that's kind of the picture that people have, all right. And I remember when I became a Christian. A part of the reason I became a Christian, I mean, I wanted to be forgiven, but I really did not want to go to hell. And, and I thought, this is what I thought. I thought, you know what, I'm going to become a Christian. I'm never going to have fun anymore. But at least I'm not going to go to hell. I'm going to wear a sheet, play a harp, be on a cloud, eat grapes, have naked baby angels running around. But at least that's better than burning. All right. Now, we got that from some picture somewhere. All right. But that is not in the Bible. All right. All right. This is heaven in the Bible. Listen, I saw a new heaven or atmosphere and a new earth. The Apostle Peter says that this earth that we know, this is what he says. This is a, a quote. He says, the atmosphere will explode in fervent heat and every element will melt. Right? You say, is the world going to end in some sort of a nuclear catastrophe? No. The way the world is going to end is God is going to say this one is worn out and he is going to burn it up. God's going to do that. Every element will melt. Your house, your car, your ring, your, your 401k, whatever you've got, it's going to be gone. Right? All of it. But then he's going to make a new heaven or a new atmosphere and a new earth. How many of you know when man sinned, God cursed this earth? It's beautiful, but it's under a curse. Can you imagine what God's going to do when he brings us one? Well, he takes away the first that he can establish the second. He's going to bring us a better one. Uncursed. Perfect. Perfect earth. 
the first heaven or atmosphere and the first earth had passed away, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. God moves. He moves from what we call heaven, and he comes down to earth. But when God moves, he doesn't take a U-Haul. He takes a city. That's what it says. He takes a whole city, 1,500 miles square. And God comes down with the city. All right? I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying. There will be no more pain for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said to me, Behold, I make all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are true and faithful. Heaven is not going to be a boring place. Heaven is going to be more awesome than you can imagine. And that is literally a promise from God. Listen to this. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has entered into the heart or the imagination of man those things that God has prepared for those that love him. What God has prepared, the Bible says, is so awesome, nobody has even imagined how good it is. How many of you have got a pretty good imagination? It says what God has prepared is beyond our ability to even imagine, all right? So let me just give you 10 benefits of eternal life, of the life everlasting. Number one is we get a brand new body. This corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. To be mortal means to be death doomed, to be subject to sickness, disease, pain, death. But the, this mortal body... It's going to put on immortality, no longer subject to sickness or disease or pain or death. How many of you have noticed as you get older, things are wearing out? They're deteriorating, all right? But the truth is, <laughs> we're going to get a new body. Right now, you know, things are getting old. Things are slumping. Men get furniture disease. You know, their, their chest ends up in their drawers. Stuff is just moving. Things are not working the way they're supposed to work anymore. All right? But all of that death and decaying and sickness and aging and disease is going to be gone, and you're going to get a brand new body, perfect, just like Jesus' body. Well, that's good. There will be freedom from pain and sorrow. God himself will wipe away every tear from their eye. No more death, sorrow, or crying. There'll be no more pain for the former things have passed away. The hurts from your past, your failures, your disappointments, the crippling pains that you've had as you've experienced different things in life, every one of them, God is going to wipe them away. And heaven is going to be a place of perfect peace and joy beyond your imagination. Number three, the ultimate personal estate. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He's gone to prepare a place for you. Number four, all our questions are going to get answered in heaven. Now I see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. I don't know about you, but I got a lot of questions. Those six days of creation, were they 24 hours? Were they a long period of time? And where did Cain get his wife? And by the way, where has the ark been hidden anyway? The ark of the covenant. Not, not Noah's ark, but the ark of the Where had that thing been? All right. And, and beside, but, but I have got, how many, let's just, let me just ask you, how many, there is stuff that has happened to you or people you know, and you're just like, why did that happen? And why didn't my prayer get answered? Why? How many of you got some whys? <laughs> right? When we get to heaven, all of our questions are going to get answered. It's going to be a great adventure. This new heaven, this new earth. The Bible says 
that even creation, for the earnest expectation of creation, eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Even the creation itself is going to be changed. This world is going to be so much more beautiful and awesome than what it is right now. Wow. Number six, we get to hang out with all of our heroes. Jesus said that they will come from the east and the west and we'll sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Can you imagine having dinner with Moses? Having lunch with Enoch? Having breakfast at King David's hotel in Jerusalem with King David. Number seven, it is going to be a tremendous time of family reunion. Now, Jacob is about to die. He knows it. He gathers all of his kids together. And he talks to each one of his kids. And he admonishes each one of his kids. And he said to them, I'm about to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my father in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite. We were just there about four months ago. In the field of Machpelah, which is before Madre in the land of Canaan, that Abraham 